Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ollie. I'm a final year med student at the University of Warwick. Now, the question we're going to be discussing this time uh, was, again, quite common. I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but there were a lot of questions, so common things are going to be common. But I think first we just need to define what specialty training is, uh, for example, because this might mean different things to different people and is actually different in different parts of the world. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, how specialty training and, and career progression works for UK doctors, because I think it's important to understand that structure before we move on. So the basic pathway is you do medical school, that usually takes four, five or six years. You then do two years of foundation training. Everyone has to do this six jobs of four months each across a range of medical and surgical specialties designed to make you into a safe and competent young doctor. It is only from there that you can then apply for specialty training. Unlike in the US, for example, where you will finish medical school and you will match into an internship in a particular specialty, in the UK we don't have that. You can't directly leave medical school and start training in a particular branch of medicine. We have the foundation training that goes in between. So you actually don't even have to think about specialty training until at least a year or so after you finish medical school. And once you finish foundation training, there are basically two pathways that you can move down when you're thinking about specialty. Most specialties in the UK across medicine and surgery require what's called core training before you can go into them. This is more generalist training in either medicine or surgery. So let's say I want to be a general surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon. I would complete two to three more years of training in core surgical training, rotating around a mix of jobs, and then apply for specialty training in orthopedics, say. Alternatively, let's say I want to be a cardiologist. Uh, in a similar vein, I would do two to three years of additional core medical training, just rotations in general medicine, and only after that can I apply for my, you know, four or five years of specialist training to become a cardiologist and only do cardiology. Alternatively, there is another smaller group of specialties that operate via what's called run-through training. And this is a bit of a more streamlined process because it means that after your foundation years, so you've done your F1 and your F2, you recruit directly into a run-through training program. And this is designed to take you from the bottom, which is called ST1 at this stage often, all the way up through to ST8, specialty training eight, because it takes eight years of specialty training in these run-through specialties, whereas the other ones that we discussed, it will only take four or five years of specialty training because you've already done those years in core medical or core surgical training. So for this group of specialty, which includes things like paediatrics and neurosurgery, you actually recruit two years earlier, effectively, and you go straight into training rather than having to do core medical or core surgical beforehand. There are advantages and disadvantages to each, but that's not the topic of this video. <laughs> because the question for this video was, what are the hardest specialties to get into? And that I think very much depends on how you define hard. What I would assume that most people mean by this is which are the most competitive specialties and that might mean which are the most oversubscribed for the number of places there are available or what are the competition ratios like for each training post. Because this is something to appreciate about UK medical training, for example, and perhaps medical training all over the world. And this brings us to the next talking point, which is that in the NHS and indeed any health system around the world, you only need a certain number, right, of each type of doctor at any given time in the UK. And indeed, our health system can only support a certain number of doctors of each type at one time. Because, for example, while we need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of GPs, because GPs provide community level care, and there are never enough GPs to fill demand, we need very few cardiothoracic surgeons and neurosurgeons, for example, or allergy specialists, because these things are super niche. There are not that many people at any given time who need those services. Whereas things like GP, emergency medicine, acute medicine, we need loads of those because that represents the demand of the population. You know, common things are common. Acne is common. Chest pain is common. Bony fractures are common, but stage three glioblastomas of the cerebellum 
are not common and we don't need that many neurosurgeons. And what this means is that every year there are a certain number of what are called training posts or training numbers allocated to each specialty. And that usually just reflects the nationwide demand of services. And so depending on how many of these new specialists we need in a given specialty, there will be more or less training places available, and this influences competition. Thankfully, all of these things are visible. There is a document that gets published every single year with the number of people that applied to each specialty in a given year, as well as how many places there were available in that same year, which obviously provides you with a competition ratio or a ratio of the number of people which wanted to be this type of doctor compared to how many places there actually were available to train that type of doctor. And there is some weirdness that gets involved because different specialties, like I say, recruit at different times in career progression. Some recruit at ST1, that's straight after your F2, so they do run through training, whereas others require core medical training and core surgical training, so they recruit later. Some specialties do both, and increasingly that's what we're seeing. And what this leads to, I suppose, is a situation where lots of people enter medical school wanting to do a certain subset of very exciting specialties, and so competition for those specialties is very high, usually because we don't need that many of them, but lots of people want to do that job. And really good examples of that are things like neurosurgery, cardiothoracic surgery, in fact, surgery in general it has a reputation for being quite competitive because there are always more people that want to do it than there are funded training places. Some specialties will actually under-recruit or have a desperate need to recruit, and these are things like GP and psychiatry as well as emergency medicine in some cases. And this is for very different reasons. A lot of it is to do with the weird, toxic medical cultures that exist around certain roles. Like, there definitely is a stigma surrounding psychiatrists. It's really bad because mental health and psychiatry is really important as a specialty but we're in this situation where not that many people actually want to do it so it struggles to recruit competition ratios are very low as a result but they can never get enough doctors to fill all the places that are available gp is another example we need loads and loads and loads of people to do it because the demand is super high but when you look at trends not enough people necessarily want to do it which is a real shame and most specialties obviously then just lie somewhere on that spectrum because your competition ratio, if no one wants to do the job, could be one, where there is one applicant per place. It could even be less than one, where fewer people applied for a job than jobs were available, which is a really bad sign. You really don't want that for your specialty. On the other very competitive end, you can end up with things like cardiothoracic neurosurgery, where it can be 10, 20, applicants per single place and competition is super high. Most things lie somewhere in the middle where it might be between one and say six or seven applicants per place. But it varies a lot year on year and I've linked the document down below where you can see uh, the most up-to-date trends on specialty competitiveness. And then the other interesting situation that you can end up with is that some specialties, really, really obscure specialties, things like allergy medicine and audio vestibular medicine, jump to mind where we need really really few of them because they're so super specialized there could legitimately be as few as one or two of these jobs funded every year and they can actually end up with weirdly inflated competition ratios because it might be the case that 10 people apply for the one job that exists and that's still very very few people applying for these jobs compared to some of the other specialties but because there is only one job or one or two jobs available, the competition ratios are really, really high, even though it's a really obscure, weird branch of medicine. What influences how competitive things are? I suppose adrenaline, uh, romanticization of certain specialties, prestige, status. And we know, for example, that a certain super driven percentage of the population will work towards whatever the most competitive thing is purely for the sake of achieving it super super type a people it could be work-life balance um some people want a really good work-life balance different specialties offer that in different amounts some people want to earn lots of money and certain specialties have much more of a private market uh, within them compared to others. Think about something like plastic surgery. You can probably make a lot more money as a private Harley Street plastic surgeon 
than you can as a private emergency medicine doctor in most cases, for example. Radiologists, for example, can get paid an absolutely enormous amount of money for simply reporting scans because the NHS can't cope with reporting the number of scans and x-rays and all the rest of it that are done. There is a huge industry that exists around clinical imaging and people can do it from home, just churning out private scan reports and earning loads of money and that may be something that you want. But what is the most competitive specialty or the hardest specialty to get into? I would say if I had to pick one that I was gonna predict every year, I would say cardiothoracic surgery, I think. But it does vary every year and there is some statistical weirdness that goes on but as always the best thing to do if you're interested is simply read the documents that are out there they are publicly available not particularly difficult to find and it may influence the amount of cv padding you might want to think about during medical school and during foundation training so i hope that answers the question guys sorry this has been a bit of a ramble but it is interesting take care and i'll see you next time if you've enjoyed this video guys there are three ways that you can help and support the channel the first is by liking commenting and subscribing the second is you can buy me a coffee using my ko-fi link and help keep me awake during the editing process my eye bags are gucci the third is you can use my referral link in the description below to save yourself 10 percent off complete anatomy 2021 my favorite anatomy learning tool take care and i will see you next time